With having done complex numbers, the purpose of this video and the following videos is to work through the tools that we will need to talk about Fourier series. Now, the first tool that we need is orthogonality. Orthogonality, what it is in the standard vector space case, consists of if we have a number of vectors, v1, v2, v3, then the question that are orthogonal to each other, meaning that vi dot vj, and I will usually use the bracket notation, vi vj bracket, is equal to one if i is equal to j, and zero if they are different. If we have such vectors, then, well, it's very useful to know that they are linearly independent. And any other vector we can express as a linear combination, so this is an R3, we can express in that basis by some components, uh, say, AI, VI. And how do we recover these components? Well, the tool for recovering these components is looking at V inter inner product with VI. And if we have this orth orthogonality, what this becomes using linearity of inner products is the same thing as AI, VI, V, VI. AI, VJ, VJ, we have to have a different, let's see, oh, sorry, let's use AN. VN is our summation index. But this here, this inner product, will give us only something when n is equal to i. So in that case, we get ai vi vi. So indeed, better to think of this formula this way, that v, this v, uh, inner product with vi is a way of computing the i coefficient. So what I wanted you to keep in mind from this is that there's a special role played by orthogonality and it allows us to recover these coefficients using inner products. The, the tool, reason I mention this is that Fourier series is a lot like this, except that instead of R3, we are working with an infinite dimensional space. So say the space of continuous functions on R. And instead of vectors on that, because we have infinite dimensions, we will use a basis of special vectors. And these special vectors will be functions that are these e to the i and thetas. But to make that all rigorous, we will need to first define an analog of a dot product. What does it mean to dot two functions f and g? This can be defined as an inner product, as an integral. And we'll put a factor one over two pi here. We'll see later why it comes there. We take f of x and then we take gx conjugate dx. This is because we have targets that are complex valued. If these were real valued, as is often the case, we don't need the conjugate here. But because of our basis being i to the i n theta, we will need the conjugate because we're working with complex numbers. Now, corresponding to this inner product, we have a lot of similar structures that we have on Rn. If we want to define a norm, so-called two norm, what is this? This can be defined as square root of the inner product of f with itself, which is the same thing as integral from zero to two pi of f squared dx, 1 over 2 pi and square root. So that gives us a norm. If we want a distance between them, once we have a norm, we can define a distance between two functions as the norm of f minus g. And corresponding to all these, we have a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. One of the early week supplementary lectures discusses this. So the inner product of f and g is bounded by the norm of f times the norm of g. So we could go down this road and talk about the open balls and the convergence there, et cetera. 
completeness, compactness, all these things. We will not do that now. This space with these norms is usually called L2, in case you want to look it up somewhere else. It's called L2, and this tool, these terminology, what it's related to is called related to Hilbert spaces. But we won't need a lot of the properties there right now. And as we discussed, in the case of R Rn, well, we have some vec when some bases of vectors that are perpendicular. These could be the standard bases or some other bases of vectors. And then we can express everything as a sum of these elements, sum of the linear combination of these vectors, where the components are given by the inner product with respect to that. So these are the components with respect to that basis. And this answers how to find these values. So AI is V here. Now you should think here that this is like the analogy here is that we want to find, to convert our space into the space of functions. So continuous functions on R that are two pi periodic. This is not quite a nice enough space, but it's a good start. The basis vectors, we will convert to e to the i n theta. So these are now functions. There are elements of this vector space. And the inner product is the inner product of f and g. And based on this hope that we could express v as a linear combination of these, we now expect that we could express any function as a linear combination of these complex exponentials, e to the i n theta. So a combination of these terms. And we would hope that a n would be given by the inner product of that with these basis vectors e to the i n theta. So this side is familiar. This is your 115a world. This is what we will now discuss. But there's a way of you should be mindful of these analogies here, and we will discuss specifically one of the tools that we need is orthogonality. So if we take, and I want to abbreviate for this discussion now, define for us e n theta, this is a function, which take is e to the a n theta. So the basis this way can still be denoted by e n, but this time n is an integer with any integer that we have. So let's compute these. This is a straight, com for straight computation. So e the inner product of e to the n, e n and e m is one over two pi integral from zero to two pi e to the i n theta times the conjugate of the other one e to the minus i m theta e theta. So this is one over two pi integral from 0 to 2 pi, e to the i n minus m theta e theta. Now there are two cases. If n is equal to m, then what we have is the exponent is equal to 0. And when the exponent is equal to 0, e to the 0 is equal to 0, uh, 1. So we have integral of 1, and we get 1. And this is the point where we put the 1 over 2 pi because the length of the interval is two pi, so we want this interval to be one. And that way we, we obtain that by normalizing the interval by two pi. But when n is not equal to n, well, we can integrate this in the usual way, imagining this is a real integral. So this is the integral function would be one over i n minus m. And the substitution would be from zero to two pi, e to the i, n minus m theta d theta. The factor here comes, once we integrate, we have to divide by that factor. And in this case, this is 2 pi periodic. So the value at the top minus the value at the bottom will give you 0. So this is 1 over 2 pi, 1 over i n minus m, times 1 minus 1, which is 0. 
because one minus one is equal to zero. So this indeed shows that when the indices are different, the inner product is zero, and when the indices are the same, the inner product is one. Okay, so next, let's briefly discuss what is this useful for. Suppose I now had my continuous function, and suppose that f theta would be a very nice limit, let's say a uniform limit of such a series, a and e to the i n theta. Then, well, how would we recover a n? Well, we would hope to recover a n as follows. Let's do a computation. Let's do f inner product with e n. E m. Well, what is f inner product with e m? This is a sum of all the terms. We'll take the a n out. And uh, we have the nth basis element, inner product with the mth basis element. And this inner product here will be one only when n is equal to n. So what we have here is a n times one, a m times one. Because this will give us one when n is equal to n. Otherwise, it gives you zero. So this gives us a formula for a m. A m would have to be equal to that inner product. Now, there is a ma major issue here that we haven't uh, touched upon yet, and we'll discuss in other videos, is when is this convergence justified? When can you take the inner product inside? So this leads us to the fact, not a theorem, that if you have a Fourier series in any reasonable sense, then the coefficients have to be given by f inner product with e, the nth basis element, and this function is e to the i in theta. As above. So now what we have to do in the remaining tools is we have to talk about when and how does this series converges, converge, and if we define these coefficients, how do we get desired convergence? How does it depend on f? Tool here that will be useful, or idea that will be useful, is that we can prove that if we have two trigonometric series, sequence, polynomials, a n e to the i n theta, and then another one with coefficients b. And suppose these define the same function. So these are equal for all theta. Then we can actually conclude that a n is equal to b n. And why is this? Well, if these are finite sums, then our calculation above can be justified. So the inner product of f with b, let's use an index m here, so we can use n for summation, will be the same as the inner product of f with uh, the sum with e m. And the only term again here that comes out is m equals one. And this is justified now because we have a finite sum. But similarly, on the other side, the b m term is g inner product with e m. And this is valid because f and g are finite sums. The issue that we will have to work in general is that we have infinite sums, and then we have to worry about convergence. And the corollary of this fact is a useful observation that if you have a C finite sum that is from real to reals, and this will be true when you have an infinite sum, but the proof I will not give, then you can actually know, you know something about these coefficients that a n determines a n minus one by this relationship. And why is that? Well, if you are a real number for all theta, then f of theta is equal to the conjugate of f of theta. But now write this as the left-hand side, you can write as sum of a n e to the i n theta. And the right-hand side, you can write as the same thing except conjugated. But if we conjugate the sum, we can take the conjugate inside, and the conjugate is multiplicative, multiplicative. So we're using the fact that a plus b bar is a bar plus b bar. And we're using the fact that a times b bar is a bar b bar. And then one of these facts that the bar turns the sign, the plus sign here into a minus sign.
in V small. But if these two are to be equal, well, we want the exponents to match. So we, what we can do is we can flip the sum. So change do a change of variables that flips n to minus n. Well, that changes the n in the subscript and in the superscript, when we do that change, we get a positive n theta. But this way we get two sums. And by the uniqueness that we've just discovered for finite, we get that a n is equal to a minus n. This ends this proof. This argument you want to remember because we will do something similar to this in infinite for infinite series.